All right, everyone. Uh, here's uh, Mr. Terry Cabell um, on preparing for HSP, the astronomy uh, portion of the show. It's our third presentation today, and I appreciate everybody sticking with us. Uh, Terry, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I'm Terry Cabell, and I've been a volunteer staff member at AHSP and Night Owl Star Party since 2008. The purpose of this short talk is to offer suggestions for you to consider about astronomy equipment and accessories that might be worth bringing along to Spruce Knob. These recommendations are based upon my personal experience, as well as that of my friends and associates who've been observing at AHSP for the last 15 years. I hope even veteran AHSP attendees watching today might pick up a tip or two. And talking about these options this afternoon gives everyone nearly four weeks to decide if they might want to supplement their packing lists. Now, the gear I'm talking about today follows one guiding principle. Although there are many ways of saying it, I like the one author, blogger, and amateur astronomer Ron Melise uses, and that's more better is the enemy of good enough. So these suggestions are relatively inexpensive and probably available for pickup or delivery in the next few weeks. I've drawn up a list of vendors who likely have these items in stock, and I'll tell you where to find it a little bit later and also answer any questions you might have. So for right now, let's get started. We're talking about preparing for HSP, and that means anticipating the weather, packing the right observing tools, and making plans to avoid what I call showstoppers, or things that are gonna keep you from enjoying your time and spending it observing up at HSP, which is why we're all there after all. So to start this off with, we're gonna talk about anticipating the weather. Now, when I show a picture like this to people, I don't want you to get the idea that we're gonna see something like this at HSP. It's not at all likely, but even the mildest inclement weather can be a disaster if you haven't prepared for it. So I wanted to offer some suggestions on things you might bring along to set up in anticipation of some things that might happen, but probably won't. So I'll start with a very simple thing, a pet leash anchor. You've seen them around, people use them to uh, secure the leash for Rover so Rover can run around in the front yard without getting away and nobody has to watch him too closely. But these things work great for securing tripods on a field. We get a bit of wind sometimes at AHSP excuse me, and that way to support your tripod in the wind is with one of these anchors. You just screw it right into the ground and attach your lines from the legs of your tripod directly to the anchor. As you can see here, the anchor is secured fully into the ground. There isn't much left above ground, just enough for the, the straps to attach to it from the tripods. Now, I should add, for people who have Dobsonians, securing the daub to the ground and keeping it anchored so it can't move is not a really good choice. The advice I've gotten from daub owners who've gone up to HSP is to let their Dobsonian rotate in the wind. Go ahead and cover it up to protect it from the elements, but just move everything out of the way so that the Dobsonian can swing through an arc of 360 degrees and adjust to the way the wind changes so that, that keeps the structure of the daub from being affected by trying to stop itself in the wind. Another thing that's handy to have around, as Alex has mentioned, the basic tarp and line. Now, there are a couple of ways to look at this. There are the regular flat tarps that we use sometimes to put under uh, the things we're going to use to observe in order to avoid things dropping into the grass and disappearing. And there are also things like specially designed tarps. Alex mentioned Telegizmos, and they're a great company, and you can purchase specifically designed covers for your telescopes. And they come in various versions, but the best of them is one that is double-sided, that has the silver side to protect you and reduce the amount of heat your telescope equipment receives over the course of the day. And the other side is a weatherproof cover for things like high winds and uh, rain and that sort of thing. I should mention, as Alex did too, it's worth re-emphasizing, if you're sunscreening your scope, plan on bringing sunscreen for yourself too. At altitude, the sun is much more intense than you can realize. And even wearing a baseball hat that would normally keep you just fine is gonna end up with your ears getting sunburned because they're exposed to the light of the sun during the day. 
Now, these tarps can be supported on your telescope and attached any way you want. And all of these can provide, be provided very cheaply by going to some place like Walmart to pick them up. Another thing you may not have thought about is how you protect equipment that is out on the field with you, either from rain or from dew, especially if either shows up unexpectedly. I've found hefty jumbo storage bags, the two and a half gallon size, which you have to look for, they're not always available in the grocery stores, are great for securing things like uh, paper, notes that you're making, or uh, atlases that you're using on your tabletops. So having some of those around to keep equipment dry in lieu of having to stuff it in a pocket or run and hide it in your tent when it rains is a great idea too. The humble closed cell foam pad doesn't get anywhere near enough respect in, among amateur astronomers. Now this pad I picked up at Walmart, it's a straight insulating pad for a sleeping bag, but it has lots of other uses. You can cut up portions of it to serve as an insulating pad on your table where you have your observing equipment because it's a way to keep your electronics from coming in contact with the cold table as temperatures drop. Also, you can use it to create an extension for your dew shield. As Alex mentioned, and I've found to be true in my experience, the dew up at AHSP can be exceptionally bad on occasion. So it's best to be prepared for that, even if it doesn't happen. So one way to do that is to take one of these closed cell foam pads and cut it up and create an extension for your existing dew shield. You just tape it right on the end. Last but not least, absorbent towels. Now towels are the sorts of things that uh, we use for the shower, but they're also extremely handy on the field, especially if you have uh, dampness coming in from dew. They can serve to clean off your equipment that's accrued dew over the evening, and they can also uh, cover up things on the table to keep them from uh, attracting dew. Now that's enough about being prepared for the weather. I want to sort of talk for a bit about the kinds of things you can bring along that help your observing, either to keep it working right or to make allowances for things when you need extra help. So I'm going to break it up into four things. They include packing uh, the right stuff, basically duct tape and other things like duct tape, options for passive illumination, uh, dew protection, and observing chairs, because I'm a big fan of all of those. So first of all, duct tape is one of those things that's just nice to have around, especially if it's light colored, so you can see it in the dark. There's always something that needs attaching, either because the wind's a little more brisk than you thought it might be, or a piece of equipment cracks and needs something to seal it back together again. And having a couple of pairs of scissors with bright colored handles that you can see in the dark are always a plus. Now, for those of you who have Dobsonians or go-to telescopes that require tripod balancing, bubble levels are cheap and easy to bring along a couple of them in case you lose one so that you can make sure that your equipment is level on the field. And if you're like me and you're using scissors or you're using a knife, having some band-aids along that you don't have to run over to the first aid box to get is a time saver too. A couple of things some folks might not think about are the abrupt temperature changes overnight at the Almost Heaven Star Party. Now, different metals have different effects when they are cooled. Some shrink more than others. And I found things like filters attached to the ends of diagonals can sometimes shrink more than the diagonal when the temperature drops. And the effect is that the two become sealed together just about as well as if they've been welded together. So having a couple of ways to remove filters from the, either the ends of your eyepieces or your diagonal is a great idea. And here are a couple of suggestions. You know, you've probably seen it around people who use a shelf liner or any kind of rubberized lining material and make a little patch of it and have it in the, in the, in the box in order to use to remove a filter. And you also have camera lenses filter wrenches that you can pick up from any filter supply store. Luminescent tape is a great option because it doesn't require any batteries. So I'm going to push that very hard in this description and show you some examples of how vital it can be to keep your equipment intact. You can get this from Amazon and it typically costs maybe five, six dollars a roll for 20 or 30 yards of the stuff. It's weatherproof. 
and temperature resistant. So as the temperature gets cold, it doesn't crack, get brittle or fall off of equipment to which you've attached it. So if you have it, uh, you can use it in a variety of ways. I'll get to that in a minute. I make notes over to the side there. They're great for uh, putting on chair legs, tripod legs, little pieces on your electrical cords that you string along the ground so people don't trip over them, and adding them rings of that to flashlights or eyepiece caps to keep them in line when they fall on the ground and you can't see them right away. Open-sided foam uh, padding, such as you see there in the center, is another good example of something to have because you can place it on the table that you're using for your observing equipment and either help to insulate electronics that are there or you can flip it over and use the ridge side because it's a great way for you to put down an eyepiece and not have it roll off the table when you aren't looking, which I found they have a tendency to do. And having a few extra lens wipes is never a bad thing either. Here's some examples of the uses I put luminescent tape to on the field. Now, think about it in terms of the fact that while you may know where you put your stuff, somebody who comes by and wants to visit may not. And that field can be extraordinarily dark at night, especially when everybody is doing the proper light discipline, discipline while they're observing. So you can see I put pieces of tape around the top of the observing chair and down by its feet, and also done the same thing to essentially outline the comfortable chair right next to it. Done the same thing with the tripod legs of my tripod, so that way you're not going to be tripping over them as you go around the field, because you're going to be moving around a lot. If we have a good night, you might be out there for seven or eight hours, and your scope might be moving in all directions to capture objects you've never had the opportunity to look at before. So having a clear understanding of where everything is around you while you're observing is really essential, not only for you, but for anybody else who's nearby and might want to come visit. Dew, as Alex had mentioned, is an issue sometimes at AHSP. It can be non-existent one night, and the next night it could be almost as though you're at the bottom of a swimming pool. So being prepared for the worst helps you achieve the best results when you're observing. Now these are some additional things you might think about bringing along in addition to your normal dew controller and dew strip. And I've got three of them here. Uh, the one on the left is a hairdryer. Now they come with AC-DC versions or 12 volt versions and either one works fine. But it can act as a supplement to your dew strips and your dew shield to clear an objective lens or a mirror and help keep it warm enough that the dew point doesn't cause dew to accrue to it as you go through the night. So think of it as a, a way to supplement your existing dew protection and give you that little extra zap you might need in order to continue observing. Dew shields like AstroZap are great, but the commercial ones typically are shorter than they really need to be. So think about that humble sleeping pad I showed you earlier from Walmart, and you might end up finding you want to make a longer piece to stick on the end of your AstroZap just to give it a little bit more protection and give it a little bit more space that is kept at a above dew point temperature while you're observing for your objective lens or your mirror or your corrector plate if you're using an SCT. Uh, that little set of wires there in the center is just a reminder for me uh, a lot of folks use dew controllers because you can control multiple dew strips and you can adjust the temperature so you're not using as much of your battery supply as you would if they were on high. Sometimes those um, dew controllers fail or don't work quite the way you want them to. This device is very simple. It's just a 12 volt plug with two RCA female plugs at the other end and you just plug it directly into your power source and you can attach two dew strips to the connectors, the red and the white ones you see there. It gives you full power for your dew strip, which doesn't have the flexibility of a dew controller, but in a pinch, if your controller isn't working right, this still gives you the advantage of being able to use your dew strips for uh, an insurance cost of maybe $25 or so for that extra kit. Or of course you can make your own. And finally on this list is the humble chair. Once again, for folks who haven't had the opportunity to experience a great night at the Almost Heaven Star Party, you have the chance to observe for six, seven, eight hours, and the sky will be absolutely stunning. One thing I can guarantee if you're not properly prepared, your rear end is gonna feel it, and that's gonna affect how well you can conduct your observing sessions. 
Now, there are lots of observing chairs out there. This is the least expensive one I've been able to find. It's got an acronym. It's called the LIBAR, which basically means lift your butt and rotate. And that's what you do with the chair. As you can see, it's just four pieces of wood hammered together, but in an orientation such that each side gives you a different height. So you can see from the label there, site seat one will put you at a certain position in relation to your eyepiece. If you take the whole assembly and turn it clockwise 90 degrees, you have seat number two, which is slightly higher than seat number one. And then if you turn it another 90 degrees clockwise, you'll see that the bottom of this seat in the picture becomes the top, and that gives you an even higher position. Now, folks with some sorts of gem-mounted SCTs and those who have gem-mounted refractors often have quite a time because the eyepiece can move quite a bit vertically. So a seat like this is an inexpensive way to adapt to that. And you put a cushion on it, and you're pretty comfy overnight. Now, of course, there are purpose-made chairs like this starbound chair that provide an infinitely adjustable seat that can flow up and down these rails. And when you sit on it, that provides sufficient friction for the seat to stay in place where it rests at the time you sit inside. Now, these are great seats, and they're relatively lightweight. The only disadvantage they might have is sometimes if you are sharing that seat with others and they're not familiar with it, they may inadvertently trigger it to slide out of its original position. That one minor issue with the Starbound chair is obviated by the design of the CPRO chair. Now, this is actually originally designed as a motorcycle repair chair so that you can adjust it to separate heights using the ladder back rails on the back of the chair. And the one minor other advantage it has over the starbound chair is that that seat will actually rotate to the left or the right by about 15 degrees or so. So if you have a table next to you while you're observing, you can twist over and switch out the eyepieces without having to get up out of your chair. Now I've talked about observing tools. I want to get to the more important stuff. You might think of them as train wrecks. You might think of them as um, disasters. But basically, they're the things that can happen on the field that prevent you from doing what you came there to do, which is observe through your telescope the night sky, which is a worthwhile endeavor at AHSP, better than pretty much anywhere else on the East Coast. So this group are things that I think of as showstoppers. What can you do to prepare for them? Now, the following examples I'm going to provide are just meant to get you to think about what parts of your own setup are essential for your observing at AHSP. And I'm going to offer a few examples, but think of them as generic examples. They're not system specific. They're not just about Celestron or Mead or Explore Scientific or anybody else. But there are common threads through all of them, and they involve the following. Key components, things that if they fail, you're going to be in serious trouble. Stuff that can get lost in the dark and what you can do about it because that can interrupt your observing or actually stop it cold. The power supplies that you choose to use and how you implement them to make sure that you have the most efficient way to observe as you go through the night. And the types of observing maps and software that you use in order to ensure that um, when you're trying to find what you're trying to find, you have something to hand that will help you to do it. So let's start with key components. Without a doubt, although it's a humble thing indeed, your owner's manual for your telescope is something that you need to bring with you to the Almost Heaven Star Party. It's possible we might not have internet access. You won't be able to download one. It's possible you may have put your manual on your computer, but in the bright daylight when you're trying to troubleshoot, maybe you can't read the computer screen and work on your telescope at the same time. Plus, it's a lot easier to have someone read you a manual while you're fiddling around with your equipment than it is to have them fiddle with your computer trying to go from page to page. So save yourself from trouble and order yourself, if you don't have one, a manual for your telescope. Now, this is my example of showstoppers. Uh, I actually had this happen to me. Uh, my hand control for my Celestron CPC uh, started failing. All it did was just go into an initializing mode and then it wouldn't run the telescope. And this was at AHSP on the first day. I was dead in the water. And fortunately, I had a friend there 
who had an extra hand control he wasn't using. I borrowed his, and my whole uh, experience at AHSP was saved for that year. So thanks again, Marty. Uh, the other thing there is a power cord. Now, a power cord is a pretty easy thing to replace, but not up on top of the mountain. Even if you put reflective luminescent tape along your cord, it's still possible it can get tripped over. As the evening goes on, as you get excited observing, as you move around in the sky and your equipment changes its position, it's very easy to end up ripping one of these cords right out of its socket. So go ahead and spend the extra $20 and buy an extra power cord if you have a motorized mount. Of the same token, give some thought to whatever it may be. Maybe it's a hand control or some other aspect of your motorized equipment that you can replace or provide a supplement for in case it stops working so you continue to use your telescope while you're at HSP. In other words, what are the points of failure for you? Smaller, or less impressive items can be still just as critical. The diagonal, like I'm showing here at the far back of that picture in the center, is one thing for people who have refractors, who have uh, MAC CASs, who have SCTs. They make observing so much easier, and in some cases, is the only way you can get your eyepieces to come to focus in the telescope. You have one, you have an extra one. Now, I'm not saying you get two of the very best, but certainly you could pick up a cheap, Celestron generic diagonal and have something to back up the one you carry with you just in case something happens. In case the mirror gets knocked out of alignment on the diagonal or it gets scratched in some way or something happens that renders it unusable. You've got something that you can use to replace it. Think of this diagonal and these other items as that small temporary spare tire that you carry around in your car. You wouldn't use it for everyday driving, but when you have a flat, it's the best way to keep you going where you want to get. Same token, you can have failures in things like um, these Crayford focusers at the bottom. And a cheap replacement for a Crayford focuser would be a simple extension tube, such as the one that I have there. You can unscrew the Crayford, attach the extension tube in its place, and you've got a way to continue to use your diagonal. I threw an um, a field corrector on the left hand side just for those of you who might have just one and maybe they want to pick up another one in case the first one gets scratched or damaged and otherwise affects how they can observe or do imaging. And then there are the other things that I'm big on that involve passive illumination. Now these yellow caps you can order in bulk and they're replacements and I'm still trying to figure out after hmm, basically 60 years of amateur astronomy, why manufacturers of astronomy equipment insist on having eyepiece caps black, because that's the best way I can figure out for them to drop on the ground and disappear until the next day. So think about picking up some yellow caps that you can add to your supply, and that way if you lose one, you've got something to replace it with. And you'll notice I have over there under a box labeled Advantage, little rubber bands. Some extra rubber bands are never a bad thing if you're using caps that aren't designed for the eyepiece to protect the eyepiece because they can hold them in place. Now you'll see over on the right hand side, one of my favorites, a flashlight that has some luminescent tape around the outside. Now that's a great way when you drop that thing or it rolls off the table or you step on it, something happens, you can still find it in the dark. Now these headgear flashlights, such as the one that's sort of rolled up there on the lower right, are great to have around. I'm a big fan of them. I just don't wear them that way. The way I wear them, if you want to look at my picture over to the side, is not on my head, but on my pin. Now, this still lets me use the thing. It may look silly, but I can afford to look silly in the dark because it allows me to turn it on and off and adjust it to look at what I'm looking at when I'm working on it without worrying about spreading it all over the field around me or getting in the way of my hat if I'm wearing a hat at the same time. I don't mind looking silly if it helps me to observe better than I would otherwise. And you might want to think about that too. Certainly. Whatever you do, but this, this is great because it always starts when I've got batteries in it. It's just testing it, by the way. It always starts out with a red light. Ta-da! So think about that. When you're buying whatever lights you're going to use on the field, make sure they start out red or they're always red, as the case may be. 
Batteries are something that those of us who use power for our survey for software for looking at the night sky or for running our telescopes. And we're always running against a trade-off between weight and capacity. Now, these are deep cycle powered marine batteries. This is one example of it. It's an 80 amp hour battery. They go up to 125 and they're inexpensive, but they're heavy. Their biggest advantage since they're used for trolling motors for fishermen who use electric motors to move their boats about is that they can be drawn down quite a bit. The regular battery that you have in a car is meant to give you a big hit of power to start the engine. Deep side marine batteries are meant to have a slow, steady, draw, steady drawdown. So you can end up losing 70% of the capacity of the battery over a night and get it recharged right back up the next day. You can use these kind of Minn Kota battery cases specifically for deep cycle marine batteries. They have 12 volt outlets on the sides, as well as you can see a positive and negative terminals on the side as well, and a capacity indicator to indicate how much reserve you have. If you have a big enough deep cycle, cycle marine battery, you'll find you may not need to go to a battery charging station for your whole time at AHSP. You'll pay a weight penalty for it, and that's why absorbent glass mat batteries are always an advantage. Now these kind have less capacity than a deep cycle marine battery, but they come with inverters and 12 volt outlets on the front, as well as the opportunity to charge your car if you inadvertently run out of battery power on your car and won't start. They will also permit you to draw down 50 or 60 or even 70% and be recharged and perfectly usable the very next day. We all love lithium ion batteries now because they're lightweight and they give us the kind of capacity that the batteries that we used to carry around that ruined our backs used to give us. So with a lithium ion battery, the price is really the, the stopping point. If you can't afford to have a lithium ion battery that gives you the kind of resources that a huge deep cycle marine battery can give you, then think about using these for special purposes. For example, the one on the left is perfectly adequate to run my dew strips. So I will attach it to the long end where the objective is in my refractor and just run a line from the dew strip directly to the battery as it hangs on the OTA. And the great thing about this is I don't have dew strip wires running down along my equipment and down into where my power pack is that I'll trip over over the course of the night. And last but not least, free software like Stellarium.org is not what you're going to want to use every day when you go out and observe, and certainly not something you might want to use at the Almost Heaven Star Party as your primary source for finding your way around the heavens. But it's a great backup if the software you brought with you stops working. So think about downloading it and just keeping it in reserve. If you're a paper kind of person, getting a simple atlas such as the Audubon Sky Atlas, it's a small book on the left there, or the Backyard Night Sky from the National Geographic is a great backup to your pocket sky atlas from Sky and Telescope or whatever other paper atlas you might use. Remember, it's not meant to be your primary source. It's meant to be your backup spare tire source when your primary isn't working. As my wife pointed out to me a while back, have you ever spilled coffee at exactly the wrong time? Well, one of these can help preserve the rest of your night's observing uh, in cases where that happens. And finally, just cover one other gizmo that I think is particularly helpful. A lot of you probably use magnifying finders, either correct image, right angle, or straight through right angle, or even upside down magnifying finders on your telescopes. And some of you use unity finders, finders that don't do any magnification at all, but allow you to guide the telescope to a certain star or bright object in the night sky. I'm a big fan of having at least two. So if you already use a unity finder, get another one. If you use a magnifying finder, think about getting a unity finder such as the Telrad that's there in the center and simply attach it using one of these dual mount configurations that I'm showing here. They are designed to fit with Cinta, which would be Celestron and other mounts, um, Explore Scientific, Mead, you can get any kind you want and you can get any kind of attachments for finders that you want on the dual mount. So it's a great way to have two different finders zeroed in for the evening in case one of them stops working for one reason or another. It's cheap insurance because you know how difficult it is to zero a finder in the dark. 
So avoid it by having two. Well, I've given you a lot of stuff to think about. There's no ways about that. And before I get to questions, I just wanted to mention a couple of other things. If you have equipment issues while you're at AHSP, please think about contacting any members of the staff. They can be identified with red lanyards that they're wearing. And the list of vendors that have the equipment or probably do have in stock the equipment that I've just gone over is now an attachment that's linked to this video on the Novak website. I should say I'm not affiliated with any of these businesses and the fact that you may not find your favorite astronomy store on the list is simply because I only included firms that I've done business with and transacted that business successfully. Now I've offered a lot of information for you to process. I hope you'll find it helpful and that you will also feel free to follow up with any questions either now or in the next few weeks. And remember, these suggestions are not going to be the best possible answers, but they should be adequate to your needs at Spruce Knob. In other words, they're good enough. So thank you for your attention and uh, your time today, and I'm around to answer any questions anybody might have. So what questions does uh, you want to have for Mr. Cavill? Great job, Terry. Okay. And once again, we're pushing the light sticks this week. This week only, they can be had for, oh, I think you can get a dozen of them for like $8 on Amazon. That way, that was courtesy of my wife, Patricia, who's been my um, partner in getting this presentation all done together. So please give her all the credit for whatever gets done right and blame me for whatever went wrong. Any questions? Yay. Now that made my day, Troy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great. All right.